All right, well, for, 40 minutes is longer than, than anyone wants to hear me or anyone else talk, so please be thinking of questions as I go along. I want to leave at least 10 minutes, not five, uh, for, for questions at the end, really. Look forward to the questions and, and discussion. And appreciate uh, the introduction by uh, Dr. D and framing the problem we have, but this is going to be a talk about the solutions. This is going to be a talk about how we confront climate gridlock, the topic of a book that I... Um, that I published that came out from Yale University Press in March. And when I say that I'm a climate scientist, that I study uh, the atmosphere and, and what's warming the planet, how to confront it, I've been used to getting a lot of D words, and it's not just because my name is Daniel. Um, at first, and I actually spoke to a Delang conference, I don't remember how many years ago, and I've spoken to many other audiences with a uh, wide variety of, of people, with students, with Rotary clubs, with Cub Scout groups, whatever it may be. When I used to focus my talks, and what I used to get most of those questions in that last 10 minutes from, was the doubt, was people who were questioning, is the planet really warming, the denial of what's happening, whether the fact that it's warming, whether the fact that it's our emissions that are causing it. I do devote an um, entire third of my atmospheric chemistry and climate class that I just finished teaching this semester to overcoming and going through the science of why we shouldn't doubt, why we shouldn't deny what's happening. But in an audience like this, I don't focus on that anymore because there's no denying anymore that the planet's warming. And in fact, in my 16 plus years of teaching at Rice, we've seen another third of a degree Celsius of warming, half a degree Fahrenheit of warming, just in my time returning back to Texas, returning back to my home state. So we've gotten to the point now where warming is 1.1, 1.2 degrees Celsius above where it was in pre-industrial times or the late 1800s, which is our closest proxy when we had enough uh, thermometers around to know how hot the temperatures were. And um, there's really no questioning, unequivocal evidence of that it's warming. And I can go through and bore you all with this half a semester's worth of, of all the emissions that are causing this. So now it's a different set of D words that I try to confront in my talks. The, the feeling of doom, of despair, of depression. I mean, it used to be something that I would see uh, in the newspaper articles and the magazines and the reports from social scientists telling us how uh, severe the causes are of, of the worry, that, uh, the depression that's coming with this. It, it hit closer to home. I was actually speaking at a, a book festival event in Houston last month, and the author sitting next to me was a, was a clinical psychologist focuses on uh, teenage trauma. She, her, we were each presenting our book. Her book was about teenage trauma. She said after family conflict, the biggest thing that she has her teenagers coming to her for, for counseling, is fear of climate, is fear of the planet that they're heading into. She's seeing anxiety, depression, right here in Houston among the teens that she's dealing with, worried about the future that they're heading into, thinking how could they possibly have children in a world that, that faces such problems. Well, many of that cases of doom, cases of, of fearful scenarios, comes from where we were back in my earlier years at Rice, when we really weren't addressing this sufficiently. If we look at where the policies were, what the pledges were, what the world was trying to do back uh, when I uh, started teaching at Rice in the year that, that my son was born in, in 2009, we see that, um, that we were in this time when even the pledges and the targets that countries were putting out there would have been enough to warm the planet three and a half degrees by the end of the century. Three times as much warming as we've had the 1.2 to date. In fact, if you looked at the, the details of, of Sylvia's slides, the RCP 8.5 scenarios were based around this world where emissions were expected to be much, much higher than today, a world where coal emissions were going to double or triple beyond what they were, what they, uh, what we're emitting from coal today. Fortunately, we've changed a lot from the projections that drove many of these worst case uh, scenarios. With 2015, we had the Paris Agreement, so the way the is shown is the, the, the x-axis, the horizontal, is showing estimates of how much warming we would have based on when those estimates were made. And so by the time we got to the Paris Agreement, we were doing 
a little bit better. We had gotten to this point where at least the pledges were starting to, to come in, but still if you looked at the policies, the policies weren't where the pledges are. So we were still on this track for three and a half degrees of warming, and even though the world leaders came together, they locked arms, they sang Kumbaya, we had the Eiffel Tower lit up with 1.5 degrees, but they didn't actually have anything close to meeting that. We were on track where even if they had followed all the pledges and targets that they said, we would have been on course for 2.7 degrees of warming, where the actual policies were was about 3.6. Where we came to last year with the, the follow-up COPE, the, the conference of the parties that followed up from the Paris Agreement in 2021, just as my book was about to hit the shelves, so I wish I could have uh, updated it for that time, but uh, Yale takes a while to get these things onto the shelves, is that for the first time, the pledges were getting to the point of where the overall target was, is that the world had said it would try to keep warming well below two degrees, and for the first time with the pledges that were issued in 2021, with President Biden bringing us back into the Paris Agreement and saying we would go net zero by 2050, with President Xi Jinping saying China would go net neutral by 2060, European Union by 2050. If you take all these pledges, they are finally within striking range of where we need to be. They're finally within striking range of 2 or 2.1 degrees Celsius. Now it's a gap that the policies aren't in place to do it, but the pol even with the policies, we're on track for um, 2.7 degrees of where we would be. Now, this isn't good enough because we would keep warming beyond that, but the doomsday scenarios, those worst cases, uh, the RCP 8.5s, we're not on track for anymore. So we have this agreement. Uh, there's the, the locking arms. Uh, national commitments didn't add up, but they're getting closer than ever before. So if we look at this in a way and, and reimagining it, not just to tracking where the pledges are, but where the emissions are headed. So this is the plots of emissions out to 2100. We're at this point where, as Dr. D showed us, we, we've been on this trend of, of emissions rising, rising, rising. It looks like, unfortunately, we'll set another peak again this year with about 37 billion tons of CO2 from fossil fuels. If you add in the methane and the nitrous oxide and the uh, halocarbons and other things, 50 billion tons. Okay, we just last month hit 8 billion people on Earth, so what is that, six, six and a half tons per human, uh, I think we're over 20 tons per American. But when the scientists, uh, European climate scientists mostly who are with Climate Action Tracker, when the International Energy Agency, when all the other economists and scientists look at where we're heading, look at the growth of renewables, look at where we're heading with the commitments to electric cars and so forth, we're on this track to finally stop the rise and have this plateau. A plateau is not good enough, but it's not a world that's tripling its emissions as projected before. And where the policies, if you look at what Congress passed in this past year, if you look at what every parliament has passed, what the actual policies are committed to where we've, uh, we actually have policies in place to do, it's going to get us to between two and a half and 2.9 degrees Celsius. Definitely not where we want to be, definitely warmer than we've been for millions of years, not on a four degrees Celsius world anymore, and that's if we don't implement any more policies ever, and countries keep implementing more and more policies every year, and with the pledges that were issued uh, in uh, Glasgow last year, the pledges, as we said, bring us to somewhere between a 1.8 and 2.1 degrees Celsius. So we're not heading to net zero as fast as we need to be, but we're not quite in the doomsday scenarios that we had been. So gridlock, the title of the book, Confronting Climate Gridlock. We're not doomed, we're not in an existential threat, but we need to do much better than we are. Where we are, where we need to get, is we need to get to as close towards net zero as we can. We have this challenge, what makes climate change more difficult than what my core research had been, my core research in my PhD and even in my undergraduate studies and my earliest years at Rice was mainly on, on air pollution, on particulate matter, on ozone, on other uh, ground level pollutants. Those have a huge drain at the bottom of the bathtub. Those get uh, removed very quickly. CO2 is a pollutant that builds up over decades, builds up over centuries. When we emit things into the atmosphere, a little over half will end up in the trees, will end up in the ocean but the half, the 45% that stays in the air can stay in that bathtub, can keep warming the planet 
for centuries and, and millennia to come. And we have just a very tiny drain at the bottom of it. So we're in a situation where the world, we're at a point of we're at maximum tap, we're going to start slowing down the tap. And until we can stop the CO2 building up, it's going to keep warming the planet. Unlike the cleaner air that I have studied traditionally, where rain, where deposition, where oxidation, other things bring it out, and where we've cut emissions so that our air in Houston, I don't know how many of you know, is cleaner than it's been in two generations' time. We're enjoying cleaner air than most other major cities around the world. We're enjoying cleaner air than our parents and grandparents enjoyed. Because we've brought those emissions down, now we need to do the same for bringing down the CO2 emissions and a much thornier problem where we're dealing with a pollutant that accumulates. So this is how I decided to lay it out um, in my book. Uh, welcome those of you who, who have read it or, or choose to read it going forward. Is I argue there are three keys that we need to address in order to, to deal with this. And I know as, a, as an engineer, as an pro associate professor of civil and environmental engineering, some of this is going outside of my lane. With tenure, you can do uh, things like that. And so I set about doing 100 interviews interviewed people, and a great thing about a book contract is it means that people will return your phone calls who are much smarter than you, who wouldn't give you the time of day otherwise, and say, hey, I'm an interview you for the book. So diplomats, some of the people who negotiated the Paris Agreement, negotiated the Kyoto Protocol, inventors, innovators, entrepreneurs, some of whom I got to track from when they were fresh out of school and going through an incubator program to now landing $100, $150 million of venture capital and deals with Google. Uh, and relocating their companies to Texas to get the oil and gas expertise we have here. Scholars of international relations, scholars of climate science, um, terrific, uh, just love the experience of doing this and lay it out in these chapters. What would it take to make better progress in diplomacy? What are the technologies we need most? What are the policies to get us there? I laid it out as these three keys because um, the diplomacy and policy interact with each other because without diplomacy, we don't have enough uh, to impel action. We can just keep saying, well, what about those Chinese? What about this? What about that? We need some way to get together to say we're all going to address this collective global problem. We need policy for diplomacy because otherwise, what credibility do we have to say that we should act on this problem? Diplomacy and technology that tie together because so many of the technologies we need, we're not going to be able to develop them fast enough if each country is doing them for themselves. We need them to be done in a way that we're co collaborating globally on this. We all win if we have better solar technologies, better wind, better geothermal, better hydrogen, better carbon capture. It's not so much an arms race of who can get there first. The better we get this for all, the more we can have cleaner and cheaper energy for everyone. And the diplomacy is only possible when there's better technology. The reason why the world leaders were willing to lock arms together was not because they wanted to condemn their people to living with the lights off and, and shivering throughout the winters, was because technologies were already getting to the point that they could foresee a world where we could go to net zero, where we could go to pledges as strong as they were wanting them to be, knowing that the technologies would be there and let us get to where we wanted. And technology interacts with policy. I was actually in the policy arena between my PhD and coming to Rice. We had the saying that regulation breeds innovation, that the markets can get there, but they need a push. They need mandates. They need standards. They need something to say that we're going to go in these um, directions. The classic example on the air pollution arena was when uh, under President, the first President Bush, he and Prime Minister Mulroney decided they were going to have a treaty between the countries that was going to deal with the acid rain problem that was terrible at the time, which meant cleaning up the sulfur pollution, it meant going to scrubbers that were just pretty uh, infancy of its technology back then, didn't quite know exactly how well it would work, how well we could bring down the cost. And so industry said, oh, we could do it. It's going to cost you that much. EPA scientists said, well, we can do it, and the cost will be here. When you actually have the regulation, when you're actually not just trading white papers and spreadsheets, but you have to do it and save money and make a profit, the cost ends up here. We've seen it regulation after regulation. When you have the need to do something, you end up making it more affordable than you can. And when you do so, regulators can come and say, wait, we set this cap and trade target here. We can keep lowering it, lowering it, lowering it. Now we're at a point where we have 80% less sulfur emissions from our power plants than we did in 1990 when the Clean Air Act was last amended. 
Now, what technologies are it that we need? And I'm going to focus most on technology because this is a technology-oriented conference. This is, uh, as an environmental engineering professor, my core area of expertise. So what technologies do we need to build? We need to build this uh, clean energy because over 80% of those emissions that are warming the planet are coming from our burning of fossil fuels and the leaks of methane and the other things that come with it. So our heart of addressing this is through building a clean energy future that can replace the fossil fuels that are still 80%, nearly 80% of the US economy, nearly 80% of the world economy remains fossil fuel based. How can we transition that to clean energy? I argue it needs efficiency, it needs clean electricity, and it needs fuel switching. Most of that fuel switching is actually switching to electricity, electrifying our economy. We need to control other greenhouse gases too, like methane and nitrous oxide and halocarbons. And we need sinks for the rest. But what we can accomplish from those is, is small, is, is that last 20% of the, of the puzzle, 80% is what's in the middle. So why these three pillars that I laid out? Well, we need energy efficiency so that we're not building twice as many wind farms, twice as many solar farms, twice as much of everything. We need clean electricity, of course, for electrification. There's no point for the electric cars that my wife and I drive if they were powered by coal electricity. We need electrification to be more efficient because electric engines and fuel cells can be two or three times as efficient as internal combustion engines. Heat pumps can be three times as efficient as burning natural gas or heating oil. How we electrify is both, I make this a red and a green because it can either make it easier or it can make it harder to decarbonize and go to cleaner forms of electricity. If we do it the dumb way, like my wife and I are doing with our electric cars, we just have a charger that we plug it in whenever it's convenient. Even if it's when we're coming home from work at five or six, when the sun's about to set and our solar panels on our roof, we're making less and less power. We don't care. Same price for electricity either time. And so we could have this surge when more and more people are getting the electric cars. How is the grid going to handle six o'clock as the sun is setting, as the winds are still slow and everyone's charging up at once? Or we could electrify in a smart way. We could have those be smart chargers that wait until it's windy or sunny or the demand is low and the air conditioners aren't being used as much. We can have water heaters. We can have heat pump water heaters that heat up the water a little bit extra when it sees there's extra power on the grid and uses that heat at other times. So we can be smart or dumb in how we do this. We need markets. We need policy. We need all those uh, interdisciplinary approaches of how we do this in a right way. And clean electricity is the central pillar because clean electricity actually makes those other arrows those other pillars possible. Because people say, oh, well, we uh, want to have a hydrogen economy. Center for Houston's Future is uh, looking for ways to land a hydrogen hub in Houston. If we're going to make hydrogen, even if you say, well, we don't need to electrify, we'll make hydrogen. Well, the only way you can make hydrogen at scale in a clean way, in a truly clean way, is by using clean electricity. And we say, well, why even do any of that? Why not just keep business as usual, keep on keeping on with oil and gas and coal, and we'll just capture it from the air. Well, the only ways you can capture it at the air at scale go beyond uh, some of the nature-based solutions that, that we keep finding problems with is by machines like this that companies like Oxy want to build, and they're building the first of these in the Permian Basin. These need enormous amounts of electricity to work. So unless we can get electricity cheaper, cleaner, more abundant than ever before, we actually don't have a chance of pulling CO2 out of the air at the scales that we need to. We can think about those pillars in terms of the energy economy as well, where there's an electric frontier, as NREL has shown us. We already use electricity for the bottom, uh, nearly half of the economy. We clean up electricity, we clean up that. If we can move up that electric frontier, if we can use electricity for cars, for heat, for things that haven't been electrified before, then that clean electricity can push that that heavy black line, the frontier up, and then other clean fuels can clean up what we can't electrify. After the book was already in press, opened up and see that the Biden administration, right as it was issuing its net zero plan for 2050, when he issued that plan uh, at Glasgow, heading to the Glasgow summit, they, November 2021, book was heading to press, heading to the bookshelves, uh, released the long-term strategy and wasn't surprised, but relieved they didn't come up with some wildly different approach, but they had the same exact pillars for their approach of how they think we should clean up the economy by 2050. 
again, the pillars being efficiency, being clean electricity, and being electrifying, using that clean electricity to electrify the economy and make low carbon fuels. And of course, those two smaller pillars, that's what gets them to net zero. Now that all seems optimistic, what the pessimists will say if you listen to uh, Professor Vaslav Smil, who has the ear of, of Bill Gates and others who, who like to uh, be smug and say we can't do this, is they say, well, sure, we can transition eventually, but transitioning the energy economy is a 100-year process. We can't possibly get to net zero by 2050. We can't possibly get to the targets we're aiming for because changing the energy economy, the energy economy that is a trillions of dollars economy, is a century-long project, just like we started with a decarbonized economy. We started with a renewables economy. We started with wood and water as what powered almost everything, all the way through colonial times, Revolutionary War, up to the Civil War. We were already a green economy, but then coal took 50 to 100 years to take over. Oil and gas took 50 to 100 years to take over from it. How do we possibly have the hubris to think that renewables can take over? And indeed, if you look at the same Biden administration, beyond that nice waterfall plot of how they think they can reduce emissions, if you go to the Energy Information Administration, if you look at what they project of just looking at where the policies are, not looking at the wishful uh, visions are, and had the pleasure of talking to Joe DeCarolis. He was right here at the Baker Institute uh, a couple months ago for the Baker Conference and you know, was able to have a chat with him about where these projections are coming from. This is a world where we don't bring our emissions down. This is a world where we keep our emissions just as high as they've been um, and we flatline for the next 40 years, for the next 30 years. Where we can be more hopeful though is that we've had technology transitions before, not for the entire wood to coal to oil and gas, but technologies, when they are better, they get adopted quickly. When people wanted black and white TVs, they became ubiquitous in homes within 20 years. And then we ditched them as soon as there were color TVs, when air conditioning became available, when refrigerators became available, when flip phones and then when iPhones. When something is better, when something becomes affordable, there are early adopters and all these technologies have followed these S curves of rapid adoption, exactly the sorts of curves that we're seeing with electric cars today, we saw it in carbonizing the economy. We saw it when we went from having horse-pulled uh, carriages as the main form of, uh, of transportation, for example, in New York in 1900. Fast forward 13 years, no horses left on the street. It was all cars. Keep that 13 years in mind. 13 years is exactly how long California is giving itself to get itself totally off of sales of new gasoline cars, new diesel cars. We can do it, even if you look at just the few percent adoption so far, when you have the policy or when you have something better or both, you can make these transitions more quickly than have been thought before. And it's not just California, Europe is setting many of the same targets for itself of when it's going to be banning new gasoline and new diesel vehicles from its roads. It's not just an electric vehicle thing, it's with renewables as well. IEA, the International Energy Agency, has some of the smartest economists, energy experts, in the world, and so every year they make a forecast of how much solar will be added. Each year they get it wrong. Each year they think, well, we went up, the, the amount of solar we added last year went up, but there was a fluke, there was something, so we'll just be able to, to flatline at that level where we actually were by 2021 was here. Read the uh, news alerts from Axios this morning, and IEA has just upped its projections by tens and tens, uh, or actually hundreds more gigawatts of what they think will be installed in the next five years globally. So when it becomes better, it can be done. And the reason why it can be done is because we can bring down the cost of these technologies that when the IEA projected, they know, they are smart enough to know that we, solar won't stay expensive forever. They thought it could fall all the way to 11 cents a kilowatt hour by the middle of the century. This crazy futurist, Ramez Nam, thought we could get down a little bit faster. All of them were wrong. Once you start deploying it, you could bring down the cost to where it's three cents a kilowatt hour already lower than IEA, half the price that low IEA thought we could get to by 2050. When we don't deploy things, they don't get cheap. So this is the cost curves of nuclear. This is why nuclear hasn't been getting us anywhere. Last plant was built when I was a toddler and it's gotten only more expensive with time. So how do we follow the solar curve and not the nuclear curve? We need learning by doing. We need to deploy as much as possible because just like we see with computer chips getting better and faster and smaller, Solar, other technologies can follow Swanson's law and get 20% or more cheaper with each doubling of what they've been deployed. And what it takes, and 
And really one of my favorite interviews for the book was talking to Gregory Nimitt, the Wisconsin professor who wrote an entire book on how solar became cheap. And instead of giving you a 200 page book, I'll give you the two key lessons that he found is that we need a technology push like we got from Bell Labs, like we got from R&D, making the technology better. But what he devoted most of his chapters and most of his attention to is what made it more affordable was the pull. Whether it's from carrots, whether it's from sticks, whether it's from mandates, taxes, whatever your political persuasion, find the policy you want, be sure you're getting us a market demand pull because that's what he found did far more than research and development is to make sure that if we build it, people will buy it, that these technologies won't just stay in the lab. And so illustrated, as we can imagine, if we want any of these cost curves to look like the cost curves that solar followed, we needed a push and the pull to make it happen. So what do we need to become cheap? Wind and solar are already cheap. Deploy, 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 get those out there as fast as we can, have the infrastructure and permitting that we need. We need the other things to become cheap as well, things to balance them. It can be batteries, it can be geothermal, it can be nuclear, it can be advanced hydro, and whatever we're linking together will be easier if we can finally start building things in this country again and not just block things, building the power lines that connect these various sources. Again, people have come up with lots of different scenarios. The Biden administration came up with lots of scenarios. All the scenarios are different. All the scenarios have wind and solar as the majority of the power supply if we're going to be serious, if we take seriously enough how to get there. People can debate how much role nuclear has, how much role carbon capture has. Among people who study this problem, there's just no cheaper way, no, no bigger way to get there. The renewables, that's going to take a lot of land and it's going to take a lot of transmission. So again, we need to build things in this country. We're going to need to decarbonize heat, go across industries, something as different as a glass uh, manufacturing or aluminum smelting or steel making. What they all have in common is heat, so we need cleaner ways to make heat, and we need cleaner heat for our homes and businesses. One of my favorite talks about the book was when I went to go out to the Humid Climate Conference, and only time I've ever been on a panel with an HVAC installer from Florida and with Mitsubishi's head of heat pumps. We need to find ways to get more and more of these heat pumps to heat our water and to heat our air uh, with the same devices that can be three times as efficient as other forms of heat. A lot of different colors, lots of ways we can make hydrogen. We've got research going with a couple different approaches. I've done work with Syzygy that has a technology using uh, out of uh, Naomi Hallis's lab, using ways to more efficiently make it from methane. Uh, Professor Matteo Pasquale at Rice has ways of making it from natural gas. Or most likely, if we go to scale, we're going to need most of it. And the cleanest way to do it is going to be to make it from clean electricity. We need to be pioneering those ways to make clean hydrogen and make fuels from that clean hydrogen. We need to make agriculture more sustainable. So 11% of emissions are coming from agriculture. On the right is a paper that I wrote with uh, my PhD student, uh, Lena Luo, earlier this year, where we showed that by cleaning up the nitrogen emissions, we can make air both cleaner and uh, at the same time as we're avoiding the climate warming. Pollutants, and last and least, last and least, because this is the least part of the solution. This only is possible once we get emissions down from 37 billion tons to the single digits, can we start thinking about capturing some of those emissions? And it only makes sense if we do so with additionality, if we do so with permanence, if we do so in ways that don't disadvantage the communities that are already experiencing the worst environmental justice problems. We can only do most of these, the ones with true permanence, if we've already made energy cheaper and cleaner and more abundant than it's been before. The great thing about this is all of this can be done through policy, all of this can be done through our own actions is by advocating for more research and development funding. The CHIPS bill uh, allocates, but doesn't appropriate more than doubling of funding of RPE to have those moonshot energy plans developed. And whatever your political persuasion is, however the policies can be that create that demand pull, a demand pull that also happens from our own actions, from buying technologies when they're just on the cusp of being more affordable, we can be the ones who drive down that price and make this more affordable for the rest of the world. Because the US only emits 14% of the world's emissions, we are only doing what we can if we not only bring down our emissions, but if we bring down this curve, having the means to do this, having the means to push and pull this along with partners around the world to make this so that as the world develops, we can continue to have this be the desired sources of energy. We made a lot of progress with the Inflation Reduction Act put more for uh, approaches than had ever been funded before. 
They decided almost all carrots, with lots of sweeteners, I call it a carrot cake buffet. Every technology I mentioned in the book has one or two or three or five subsidies for it in this bill. Carbon tax, great idea. What they decided what was able to pass was lots and lots of sweeteners, lots and lots of things, but that's gonna be a game changer for driving this demand pull of getting things moved forward. Can probably bring us to 40% below the emissions of what they were in 2005. And there's earth shot after earth shot after earth shot aiming at having the push, aiming at having the research and development push of researching these new technologies in ways that we make uh, hydrogen cleaner, that we make carbon capture more affordable. Secretary Granholm uh, was right at the ION where those of us who were at the reception last night met to announce the deep geothermal earth shot initiative where she wants to make uh, geothermal down to $45, and four and a half cents a kilowatt hour at the point where it would be uh, a perfect blend with wind and solar. And there's been success in things like that. Those who don't recognize the person on the left, Rice was so impressed by what he did in Sunshot in bringing solar prices down 90% over the past 11 years that we made him our vice president of research. And look like I'm right on time to leave 10 minutes for questions because I think we need questions, we need discussion. We need, hopefully, this didn't so much answer what needs to be done, hopefully it left a lot of room for what could be done, left a lot of room for not being prescriptive, but giving us the sense that we need a push, we need a pull, we're starting to get that, we're not where we need to be, we're not in this doomsday future, how can we keep addressing this gridlock, how can we keep moving forward in a way that gets us to a climate that I can't foresee a climate that will ever be as cool as it was when I grew up in, probably can't even keep the climate at the warming it is today, but how can we slow it down enough? How can we hold warming below two degrees so it's something that we can adapt to? Look forward to the questions, look forward to uh, conversation in the coffee break so we can start moving that conversation forward. Thank you. A very good presentation. Uh, a question, uh, you did not directly address uh, geoengineering uh, per se, uh, although yeah. there are some inferences in uh, mm -hmm. uh, carbon capture, et cetera, but mm -hmm. uh, can you expand on that in the role of uh, geoengineering on the process? Yeah, yeah. so with geoengineering, uh, there was National Academies put together a panel to look at geoengineering. They decided to break themselves in half. There's geoengineering that helps us lock up carbon from the atmosphere, and that, gets us closer to the climate that we're used to. It undoes the way that we're warming, and, and those solutions, if they can be done without damaging ecosystems, those are great. Those bring us more to normal uh, conditions. With geoengineering approaches that are solar geoengineering, changing how much sunshine is hitting the Earth, whether by brightening clouds or by injecting aerosols into the stratosphere, I expect, it hasn't been done yet, I expect it's doable. I expect it's cheap relative to national budgets, relative to Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos' wealth if the market hasn't crashed or if he hasn't wasted it all on Twitter. Um, it is, for better or worse, something that probably within tens of billions of dollars, you could offset decades worth of warming, but you could only offset it for a year or two. You would have to keep injecting it. For, so do we have the interest in doing that? We have no idea. or. It's very hard to predict how it would affect uh, droughts and floods and how the jet stream moves, how the ocean currents move. So I think we could, it could be affordable to undo global warming. We would create all sorts of global weirding. We would not have the weather that we had before. And who chooses it? We'll have winners, we will have losers. Um, it's opening up a huge Pandora's box of you could have within the power of a mega billionaire or the power of probably 10 or 20 countries on Earth could have the power to reset the thermostat at least for a few years, of, depending on what they inject into the stratosphere. So I think it's doable. I'm actually not worried about what it would do to the stratospheric ozone, but I think it's not a science question. I think it's more of a diplomacy question, a philosophy question, a theology question of do we want to have that power in the hands of you know, the wealthiest countries and people to be able to reset the thermostat in ways that they're going to totally change weather, totally change life on Earth, or do we bring down the emissions? Does, do we do anything that slows down the need to bring down emissions, to both draw down and, and to, to drastically reduce the fossil fuels? So I would much rather 
pursue the approach of, of fossil fuels, of cutting fossil fuels, of, of drawing down emissions, of focusing on how we, we have less CO2 in the air, rather than thinking that there will be some silver bullet that I think we just don't know uh, how much disruption it could cause. Hello. <clears throat> Yeah, you mentioned that uh, the emissions in the U.S. Uh, was about 12 percent. Does that include the uh, pro, uh, methane uh, that is produced by the uh, uh, raising of cattle? Yeah, it's 14 percent, including all greenhouse gases. You know, one of the largest residential solar companies in the U.S. is based about a mile from here. Mm -hmm. I was wondering what kind of collaboration you have today or what, given the interest here at Rice, what could be done to join together and accomplish a great deal more? Yeah. Um, so really appreciated that Sonova brought me out uh, to meet with their CEO and executive leadership team uh, about the lessons from this book. And so, um, yeah, I won't go into any details of what we discussed, but, but devoted a morning uh, with their team of of how can lessons from this apply to, to that. And, and I think, yeah, great uh, opportunities where they really work in the distributed solar space. And I, I think there's a need to have both the utility scale and distributed scale. And, and having companies like that, having this ecosystem of clean energy companies based in Texas is, is really powerful to move things forward. Maybe you mentioned this, but uh, is there like a breakdown of the biggest industries or endeavors that contribute the most to um, carbon emissions <clears throat> and car like climate change in general? Because um, often, you know, the, there is discussion around, oh, you should cut down, say, you know, flights across mm -hmm. the world because they are contributing to carbon emissions, but it's not clear which are the biggest um, culprits in mm -hmm. this? So yeah. do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so in the U.S., the pie chart on the left is the situation where transportation recently surpassed power plants because we've cleaned up power plants so much. Globally, power plants are the biggest source of emissions because Americans drive a lot. Uh, everyone uses electricity. So globally, power plants are number one. U.S. transportation, broadly defined, is number one. And then um, the other key thing, a lot of that electricity gets used by industry. So all sorts of steel making, cement, some of the biggest industries are pivotal. And then a lot of the electricity and direct use of, of fossil fuels is for um, heating and cooling of homes. So this is another way of slicing and dicing um, US data is these are, are the way. This is energy use, but emissions pretty much track with this, so so everywhere it's transportation industry, homes and businesses, and uh, but collectively we can bring all this down by cleaning up electricity, cleaning up those power plants, and then having more power plants than ever, or more solar and wind farms, et cetera, than ever, and push up that electric frontier so that we use that to replace things that are directly burning fossil fuels. Um, and is there some sort of analysis in terms of uh, which are the more like? You know, power plants are very critical to functioning of society, so sure. it will be hard to really cut down a lot, I guess. But there might be other industries that are not so critical, and you know, mm -hmm. cutting those might yeah. be um, easier. So is that? Um, I would put it the opposite way. I would say that power plants are the lowest hanging fruit. Is that it's already cheaper to build new wind and solar farms than it is to operate existing. Uh, coal and gas plants. And it's certainly, if you were building something new, we need to double electricity generation to power the electric cars, the heat pumps, the electrified industry that we have, green hydrogen. So we have an opportunity to double what we have. It's cheaper to replace the dirty stuff before. So power plants is where we've had the fastest cleanup. That's why power plants historically had always been the top source. They fall in below, techno below transportation because we've already cut power plant emissions by more than a third. And and it would more than pay for itself if we keep cleaning that up, keep going to cleaner sources. We just need to be able to build things in this country. And fail, failure to be able to build things always helps the incumbents, helps the entrenched fossil fuels. Carol? Hi, Dan. Thank you for the oh. uplifting talk. Mm -hmm. um, so how we talk about climate change tends to be a little bit fraught in my family. And Thanksgiving happened. <laughs> and I try to avoid these things. But I am thinking about buying a new car. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So the whole thing came up about how clean our uh, battery, as our oh. battery technology yep. and all the mining that goes right. along around lithium. These mm -hmm. are from people that are not exactly environmental scientists. Sure. Um, so how can we talk about I bet they're very that? concerned about birds and bats hitting a wind turbine. Yeah, so, <laughs> right, right. So how, how can we talk about that? Or do you have any advice yeah. before Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, first, good luck finding one. It took my wife almost a year to find her uh, VW uh, ID4. It's a great car. Um, so everything has trade-offs. If we could walk or bike or drive less or have better designed cities, all of that is better than just having a different car. So yes, there are other solutions that are even better. Um, but if we're going to drive, driving electric is better. It doesn't, it does have trade-offs. It's um, making the battery and the energy that goes into that and the materials that go into that is roughly, uh, it takes on the order of a year and a half to offset the extra energy emissions that go into making that battery and car. But you'll probably drive your car more than a year and a half or someone will once you sell it or trade, you know, these cars last 10 or 15 years. So over time, even with the grid that we have today, that last one and a half year beyond will be far clear, will be zero emissions, uh, or, or will be far lower emissions than the gasoline or diesel. And as I said in response to the previous question, it is much easier to clean up power plants than it is to clean up fuels. Anything that we're burning in an engine is going to be putting off exhaust no matter what, and we can't capture those emissions. We can't capture emissions from billions of tailpipes. So over time, your electric car is going to, even over the 10 years you have it, the grid is going to keep getting cleaner and cleaner. 90% of the new power sources being built in Texas, 90% of the new power sources being built across the country are wind and solar. So every year, the, the electric grid is going to keep getting cleaner and cleaner. So if it's a one and a half year payback time, and if it's, you know, half lower emissions right now where the grid is, it's going to be 60, 70, 80% cleaner as the grid keeps getting cleaner. So it is the way to go. It is not without trade-offs. It is not without impacts. Uh, we do need to find ways to get more lithium to make this something that can be scaled up, but we have research going on at Rice and elsewhere how to extract it from geothermal brines. It's, it's challenging. It's things that, uh, but it, it's solvable to, to address those problems and, and they can be a lot cleaner and, and just a lot more fun to drive uh, than the cars they replace.